Romans 12. <clears throat> Romans 12. We're going to be looking at verse 17. will be the new ground that we cover tonight. But by way of review, last week we looked at verse 16, dealing with unity. Verse 16 reads, Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Meaning, and again, reviewing of last week, be constantly seeking the advancement of others rather than yourself. Be of the same mind one for another. Means that I'm to seek for you what if I was in your shoes, you would seek for yourself. Be willing to hear and value the opinions of men of low estate. Okay, don't allow someone's social standing to make you say, well, they don't have anything worth knowing, or their, their opinion's not valid. Be willing to hear and value those opinions. Make sure that superior knowledge doesn't lead to arrogance. It can, it does quite regularly, but it shouldn't. It shouldn't. If, if you have, let's, using biblical knowledge as an example, if you have particular insight into a given passage, and you allow it to make you arrogant, then you're missing the overall message of the entire scripture. Don't do that. Don't allow superior knowledge to lead to arrogance. And then lastly, unity, again, governed by truth, not vice versa, is a hallmark of the presence of the Holy Spirit's guidance. We want to have unity as a body of, as a body of Christ, the Bible says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for men to dwell together in unity. That's something that we should, we should move for. We should, we should strive for unity. And this evening we're going to continue with some more practical steps to be taken by all Christians. Yes, sir? Going back to that verse 16, it says, But condescend to men of low estate. Does okay. that mean... Um, um, I don't want to meet, don't want to say stoop to their level, but try to meet them on their level. Is that what that condescend to men of low estate means? To to condescend in this in this uh, context would be to to be willing to deal with men of low estate. Uh, there are instances in Scripture where the Apostle Paul addressed some a church particularly. Where when somebody came in and they were all in fancy clothes, they were, they were treated well. When somebody came in in less than fancy clothes, they were kind of put to the side. And we should be willing to condescend. Not, not, when we use the word condescend, it, we usually use it despairing, disparagingly. We say, well, yeah. don't condescend. To, no, that's not what this is. This is just be willing to, to have dealings with anyone of low estate. Uh, to be willing to listen to the guy who's sitting in the corner, who you think doesn't know anything, but sometimes the guy sitting in the corner knows more than everybody else in the room combined, in, in my experience. That takes a talent. <coughs> or, uh, some people are talented in being able to deal with people. Absolutely. In those ways, other people aren't so. You know, every Christian's got talent. Some Christians have talents. That, you know, some people gravitate towards other people. Yeah. I mean, they... You know, school teachers are school teachers because they like kids and teach kids. And yeah. Teachers are working nursing homes because they like to work with the elderly. <laughs> you know, so our ability and our talent to do that to condescend. <laughs> so, you know. Absolutely. Our ability and our willingness to listen yeah. Yeah. is yeah. is yeah. something that it's it's a talent, but it's also a command. We should do it. It's hard sometimes because sometimes when somebody's talking. Again, not allowing superior knowledge to lead to arrogance. It, sometimes you, you should just listen to the person because it, it can be helpful for them to talk through whatever that is. But absolutely, it, it, is, it is a gift that some people have. Not a spiritual gift from Scripture, but it is a gift that we all know somebody who has an ability to get with people on their level. And, and to, to talk with people and it just seems second nature to them. The focus of the last few verses that we've been looking at in Romans 12 have been regarding how a Christian relates primarily, not entirely, but primarily to other members of the body of Christ. So a lot of, you know, when this other Christian, how should you relate to this other Christian? Tonight, 
we're going to kind of shift our focus from how we as Christians should relate to other Christians to how we as Christians should relate to the lost. And we start in verse 17 with when people treat you wrongly. Never happens, right? It happens sometimes. Verse 17 says, recompense to no man evil for evil. Number one, we will suffer evil treatment at the hands of others. This is not a if proposition, but a when proposition. You and I, if we are living godly, we will suffer for righteousness sake. Jesus was talking to his disciples in John 15, 18. He said, if the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Does it ever blow your mind when you look, especially in the world of, of D.C. bureaucracy and politics, you look at some of these people and you say, how can anyone, how can that person's parents like them? I mean, you, you look at them and you think, they're just such awful people. And then there's some, some, there's this pastor in Canada who all he wants to do is have church and they throw him in jail. It, it makes sense according to this. Of course the world loves their own. And, and they dislike those who, who would be against them. They dislike those who they perceive to be on the opposite side because they are on the opposite side. We should expect to be hated by the world. Jesus says, remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they'll keep yours also. Jesus came down. Jesus was the most most approachable person, the most holy person. There was no pride. There was never arrogance. And they crucified him. And if, if the world hated Christ and he was perfect, how much more will they hate me who is trying to follow Christ, though imperfectly? Because I do struggle with, with sin. And so if somebody goes, you know, if somebody goes combing through our lives and they're looking for errors, they're looking for problems, will they find anything? If they look, if they look closely enough, if they comb with a fine enough comb, right, they'll find problems. In Jesus, they couldn't. In me, they can. But if the world hated Jesus, how much more will they hate me? 1 Peter 2, verse 12, tells us that the lost world around us will, quote, speak against you as evildoers, especially in today. It seems like this is, is enhanced, where somebody who's trying to do right, somebody who is living according to the dictates of Scripture and their God-given conscience is called an evildoer. And we look at it and we say, what? why? Why is this going on? And in light of a Christian's guarantee of suffering, Paul gives guidance for how to deal with it. So Paul is basically saying, look, when this happens, don't recompense evil for evil. The word recompense means to reward, to pay, to render, to pay wages earned. Your paycheck would be your recompense. You have put in the hours, you've done the work, now you get the paycheck. The wages to recompense is to pay somebody what they have earned. Those who do evil have earned evil back, haven't they? they? They've got it coming, but not from me. That's what Paul's saying here. Look, you don't recompense evil for evil. If you look a little bit further down in Romans 12, you'll see the phrase, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. So we'll get there. We won't get there tonight, but it is coming, but it, it's not to come from me. When we read the word evil, recompense not evil for evil. The Greek word is the Greek word kakos, meaning noisome, wicked, depraved, injurious. Obviously, not good, this, this, this idea to not recompense evil for evil. One commentator says it this way. He says, we're not to pay back in the same coin. They give evil. They've got evil coming back at them, but not from me. I am to repay, and we'll see what I'm supposed to repay here in just a moment. 
The Pharisees in Christ's day taught that you should repay as good as you receive. Jesus was quoting them in Matthew 5, 38 when he said, Ye have heard it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for, the, for a tooth. Is that how the world is supposed to work? Not as far as Christians are concerned. If you, you key my car, oh, buddy, I'll, I'll put more keys in my fist and I'll, I'll do a number on yours. No, I'm not to repay. I'm not to recompense. I'm not to give you. You're, you're sowing evil, but I'm not to be the one who gives it back to you. God can take care of that. Does God keep track of what evil men do? Sure. Absolutely he does. Will God one day pay them back? Sure. Yes, he will. Will I get to watch it and laugh? No. <laughs> no. I, I may never see it. It may be that, that that happens before when they stand before God, but the judgment will come. Do you have a question? Well, there's always this, uh, a couple of things. One... Uh, there's always a chance that if that man turns his life over to Christ, then there's no repayment because Christ died for that. Absolutely. There's no repayment on on a that sin. on a moral level. There's none, but there may be. If if somebody goes around and we we live in a small town, and let's say that somebody goes and they they spoil their reputation because they are dishonorable in business. Mm -hmm. And then they get saved. Well, their sin is under the blood, but their reputation is still around town. Mm -hmm. right? So they'll have, to, they'll have to deal with the consequences of that. Somebody, so and so comes to you and they say, hey, I've, I've turned over a new leaf and I'd like to bid your job. And you say, no. <laughs> Why? Well, because just... Because I've, I've dealt with you before. Last time I dealt with you, I lost my shirt. So I'm not going to do it again. So you're right in a, in a moral sense. But there's still an element in which those who do evil may mm -hmm. suffer consequence this side of, of the grave. Absolutely. Something else? No. no. Okay. <laughs> if it comes well, back... It's like with the workers in the vineyard, where some of them only worked half the day and got paid the same money. We, you know, shouldn't be bitter about that because you know, there's a lot of hardship and toil that we didn't have to go through. I'm sure, or I shouldn't say that. You know what I mean? Though there's a lot of things that we, you know, being a Christian longer, you know, yeah, like like their reputation. Yeah. Maybe didn't get spoiled the same. I ideally, ideally that would be absolutely the case. That if if I am walking with the Lord, it's possible for a Christian to have a bad reputation yeah. too. But it's also, you know, if I'm doing right and I'm abiding by Christ like business principles, then I would hopefully absolutely be saved from that. But hard to tell. But we've discussed, I guess, different times about sometimes <clears throat> Christians can do things to irritate people, and then we say we're being persecuted because we're Christians. <laughs> yes, yes, and it's not true. It's not persecution. If if I go out and I'm rude to people, and then they don't want to deal with me, and I get a persecution complex, and I say, "Well, it's because I'm a Christian." You could say, "No, it's because you're a jerk." Doesn't matter that you're a Christian. You're mean to people, and so nobody wants to deal with you. So that's, but yeah, it, if if that is the case, and it sometimes is, that's just a a, a miscalculation on their part to, to think so. I guess where I was going earlier was if if uh, if I owe Mark some money, and it's a substantial amount, well, I'm going to pick someone that's not a Christian. And I owe them money, and and they take me to court just to get the money. I guess I have to think in my mind if if I weren't a Christian, would he take me to court? I mean, this this all falls into play too. Yeah. Not, not necessarily because I'm a Christian, but because I owe him money. Yeah. Christians should be above board in all of their business dealings. 
Yeah, and if, if not, the, the, the person's not taking you to court to get your Christian money. He's taking you to court to get your money. Or, or he's taking you to court to get his money. <laughs> that would be more accurate. Yeah. So you, you have stolen from him, you've robbed him, and he's taking you to court to get his money back. And that's, that is within his purview to do so. Yeah. But some sometime we'll go into, in 1 Corinthians, what you said, we'll use somebody who's not a Christian. Changes everything. When you start talking about two Christians, then there's a whole... Yes. A whole other set of biblical guidelines by which we need to operate. Yes. But you're right. So, rather than recompensing evil for evil, rather than paying in the same coin with which we are dealt, we are to, the second part of verse 17, provide things honest in the sight of all men. The word to provide means to take thought beforehand. I'm to take some, I'm to prepare in order to do this. Now, I told you the word for evil is the word kakos, the Greek word kakos. The, the word honest is the Greek word kalos. Two, very close, almost a play on words here. To provide all things honest, honest meaning excellent or virtuous. So rather than repaying you evil, someone comes and they treat me poorly because I'm a Christian. And so rather than treating them poorly, rather than running them down, I provide things Honestly, this word refers to the outward righteousness that indicates godliness within this honest. For instance, let me give you another saying of Jesus. He said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. So when I am dealt with in an evil manner, I'm not to return in kind, I'm not to recompense or repay in the same coin. Rather, I am to prepare, I am to prepare beforehand because if I act in the moment, what will I probably do? What is my flesh's tendency when I'm treated poorly? Lash out. So I'm to prepare beforehand to be godly in my dealings. I'm to provide things honest in the sight of all men, to be entirely above board, to be exceptional in my business dealings, to be responsible, to be Christ-like in my dealings. So that, and this goes back to a little bit of what we've talked about recently on Sunday, so that I can be blameless. Blameless not meaning to be perfect, just means that the accusations don't stick. That, that I've dealt with them. If there's a problem, that it's dealt with in a Christ-like manner. My response to being ill-treated should reveal the difference between me as a regenerated child of God and a lost person who doesn't have the Spirit of God living within them. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an ex us an example, that ye should follow his steps... Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but, com but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Jesus, obviously, the ultimate example of someone who could have, he could have paid them back with interest when they were speaking ill of him. I mean, you think about it. The guy, you remember when Jesus was on trial and, and they had him blindfolded and somebody slapped him and said, prophesy, who hit you? Jesus could have spilled the dirt on that person. He could have, he could have in that moment said who it was who hit him. He could have given their most embarrassing private sins. He could have said the thing that would have melt, made that person melt, but he didn't. Rather than repaying evil for evil, why did he not do that? When he was slapped and they said, prophesy, who hit you? Why didn't, why didn't he destroy the person? He was to go to the cross. Because it, it wasn't his purpose. Absolutely. Because he was, he was there. He was here as the suffering Savior. Now, they won't be able to get close enough to slap him when he's here as the ruling king during the millennium. Okay? Because that's when he'll be ruling with a rod of iron, and it just won't happen. But the first time Jesus came, he allowed them to slap him, he allowed them to beat him, he allowed them to nail him to a cross, and he didn't say anything. 
Again, Jesus knew all of the private, personal details of everybody standing at the foot of the cross. He could have told you the things that he could have announced to the Sanhedrin. What Caiaphas fault? You think that would have been embarrassing? Probably. But he didn't. He, he, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he was given evil, he didn't return evil. He didn't repay in the same coin. He rather provided things honest in the sight of all men. If I put myself in that same position, I have a hard time keeping my mouth shut. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not God. Yeah. And it, it, yeah. Knowing, knowing what people thought and what people were thinking. Yeah. I, I sang the song on Easter about, he, about how he could have called 10,000 angels. Jesus had the host of heaven at his beck and call. And you figure the angels wanted to come to his aid? I'll, I'll, bet, I'll bet they were straining at the leash to get down. Lord, let us go and, and, and do something. But he didn't. He had absolute power. He could, have, he could have spoken a word and everybody would have just disappeared. But he didn't. Absolute power. Absolute right. But he was willing to, to sacrifice himself. And so should I be. But sometimes, look at verse 18. Here's, here's one, of those, one of those verses that sometimes gets taken out of context a little bit. It says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. If it be possible. This is not a loophole that says it's permissible to snap occasionally. Okay, that's not that's not what this passage is. You say, you know, you you somebody at you know in your place of business or somebody they they're just getting on your last nerve, so you just cold cock them, and you say the Bible says if it be possible, and for a minute there it just wasn't possible. That's not what this is. This is not a loophole for that. This when it says um, that if it be possible is objective, not if you can. But if others will allow it. This is not if I've had all I can take. This is that sometimes others force the issue and there cannot be peace. You know what I'm saying? This is, this is not me saying, oh, just one more time. Just one more time. And you're going to get what's coming to you. That's not what this is. But sometimes when I say, look. There's nothing that you can do that's going to force me to respond in, in a way, in a, in a fleshly way, in a carnal way. But sometimes that person will continue to push until there is something that must happen. Again, not a carnal, fleshly response. I'm to be godly at all times and in every place. But there will be times when this draws the fire of wicked men. One commentator said, over others' conduct, we have no control. But the initiative in disturbing the peace is never to lie with the Christian. So fights will happen, right? But I can't pick them. I shouldn't go out spoiling for a fight saying, it's just not possible for me to live peaceably with all men all the time. No, I, I can, through the Spirit of God, if Jesus could could hold his tongue. And if Jesus could not respond in anger when somebody was slapping him while he was blindfolded or nailing him to a cross, then what can they possibly do to me that should push me over that edge? There's never a time when I should snap because Jesus didn't and I have Jesus living inside of me, right? And the Galatians 2.20, then the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As Jesus is living out his life and his love through me, there should not be a point where I snap. But there will be times when there is a disturbance. But it shouldn't be because I went out and made one. There should, it shouldn't be because I go out spoiling for a fight. In 2021, when we see culture and society turning against those who stand up for logic and reason and righteousness, this command carries additional weight. Because there are a lot of people, if, if I hold to the positions of God's word, I'm not picking a fight. I'm just standing on God's word. But there are an awful lot of people who are going to pick a fight with me because of where I'm standing. Does that make sense? Are you, are you following with me? I'm not supposed to go out and be offensive in order to pick a fight. 
But my positions, I can't compromise in order to avoid a fight. Somebody says, you better recognize same-sex marriage or you're picking a fight. No, I'm not picking a fight. I'm holding God's standard. And if you, if you intend to fight about this, I'm going to stand here. This is a hill I'm willing to die on. But I'm not to go out and look to hold needlessly offensive positions in order to draw fire. That never would be any more of a quote of, if at all possible, you know, be a Christian cop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's hold your, you, know, you have to draw a line. Yeah. And you know, there might be a, all of us, be a consequential line. Yeah. All of us should have lines beyond which I, I, I will go this far, but no further. Mm -hmm. and, and this is the line right here. I will go this far, but no further. And in case you haven't noticed, this line looks awful extreme in 2021, doesn't it? People look at you and think, you're a radical. You're a, you're a fundamentalist fanatic. No, no, I'm not. I'm just, I'm standing in the same place. The problem is, is that the world keeps going and the church is not keeping up with the world, but it's following the same direction a few steps behind. And so when I say, no, we're going to hold to God's word, we're going to do it the way God said. We're not going to adjust God's word to fit culture. People say, you're, you're looking for a fight. I'm not. I'm just we going to stand on this. We can walk by the drug house and say, you know, there's drug people there. Don't, don't get close to that place. There's going to be trouble. Yep. The cop gets called. They got to go. Yeah. And so, you know, they have to, they come up upon some really tough decisions in their jobs. You know, that, I, mean, I was thinking of being a Christian cop. Or something. That is, they, they, they got different circumstances than I was, you and I do. Well, I've wondered that too. Like, but what they're, are, well, <coughs> go ahead, Preston. They're not doing it for personal reasons, though. No. They're, they're yeah. you know. Object, objectively, they're, 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 they're objectively interfering. No, I think it was more, what, more what would you call a cop who goes out spoiling for a fight? Oh, I wouldn't call that. You know, <laughs> you'd call him an idiot, right? I mean, that's you don't do. Yeah, you'd say you don't do that. Why? But but we would have we would in positions. A police officer, exactly. A police officer who says, "Look, this is the law, and I have to enforce it." I, I may not agree with this particular law. I think the speed limit should be 55 on this road. It's 35. But I'm going to write you a ticket because I'm going to uphold the law. Now, a police officer who goes out and he's looking for a fight. And, you know, there are a few in, in the police force of the United States who go out looking for a fight. And they're the ones who end up as headlines because they get a fight. Somebody gives it to them. And it ends up causing all sorts of problems. The reason but, I bring it up is, you know, these people, politicians make laws, and then the cops are supposed to obey those laws, and then they don't have them back when they get. <laughs> so you know, they, you know, in this day and age, there's a lot of that going on. Pray for police. Pray, pray for military because yeah. they're in they're very in a very bad situation. Right now. And I, you know, I wondered, I wondered too, like where, as a believer, do not overcome or do not be going to be overcome by evil, but overcome evil for, with good. At what point does someone do evil against you? Do you say, all right, enough is enough? Um, just thinking, like, if someone, you know, you catch something, someone stealing something from you, I mean, do you, I, I know it's not evil, you know, to call the police on them, because that's, you know, they're breaking the law, but There is a lethal force or something like There's that. a biblical precedent for protecting life, protecting property, protecting the life of, of other innocents. Absolutely, there's a biblical precedent for it. That's not that's not what this particular passage is talking. There is biblical grounds for that. If if somebody comes in shooting, do we say, well, we're not gonna recompense evil for evil? No, that's that's not what this verse is saying. That's not what this this passage has in mind. This has to do with more of a of a reputation. More, some, somebody's assaulting your reputation, but you've got dirt on them. Mm -hmm. should, you, should you broadcast it? Or should you count on the fact that if I take care of my testimony, and if I mind my integrity, then God can mend my reputation. I'm going to take the high road. 
I'm not, I do have dirt on that person who's running me down. But I'm not going, I will go and I will talk to the people who they have, who they have talked to. And I'll say, look, what they said is not true. But if I start bringing it in, I say, and let me tell you what they did. Their hands aren't so clean either. Then I've crossed a line. There's something I, I can and I should be willing to stand up and say, look, I didn't, I didn't do what they said. And I can, I can, I'd love to talk with you more about it. But when I, when I descend to their level and they were saying something bad about me, but I've got something worse on them, I'm recompensing evil for evil. They were, they were dishing out evil communication. And in response, I dish out evil communication. That will take you to a very dark place very, very quickly. You had something? Well, it was. <coughs> it just reminded me of, the, of the, some of the coffee talk, you know, you get on subjects and, and you, you, you refer to something that's, you know, biblical. And they'll say, well, that's just your opinion. And I said, no, that's, God gets to make the rules. Mm -hmm. That's what the way it is, you know? Mm -hmm. And that, that was before the word. Yeah. To, to, hold to, a higher, to hold to a higher standard than everybody's opinion. And. And anybody who says, well, we all have our own opinions, they wouldn't want to live in that world. I've, had, I've had that too. You know, <laughs> this is my opinion. I said, well, uh, for instance, you can believe this pew is purple, but I said, it ain't. <laughs> you can yeah. have that opinion. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we, can, we can all have different opinions, and we all do, but God gets to, God gets to set the standard wherever he chooses to. I think in this discussion, I think about uh, when the, the uh, men of the town brought a harlot before Jesus and, they, and I think the scripture says he leaned down and started writing in the dirt and there's some folks think he was writing the, the accuser's names in the dirt he knew what they had done he didn't say nothing he just wrote their names and maybe that made them walk out you know don't know but that's yeah. one theory yeah, any anybody's guess what he wrote, but it's it's amazing that Jesus again, and that wasn't even a personal attack. Right. That was a woman who was guilty. She was caught in the very act of adultery, and Jesus didn't descend to their level. He could have said, "Well, you did this last week, and you did this this morning, and you." Did, he could have done that. He was with her last week. Exactly. Yeah. Could have, he could have done anything, but he didn't descend to their level. Rather, he he maintained integrity the entire the entire discussion. Any other thoughts on, on this? First Peter 2, as we, as we think here of if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. First Peter 2 is written to a church that's on the cusp of persecution. They're getting ready to go into a time of intense trial and, and just they're going to be put into the fire. And in 1 Peter 2 verse 9 we read, but ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Verse 11, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak evil against you as evil evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. <clears throat> it has been my experience on a couple of different occasions where a Christian is the subject of rumors and gossip. And I've seen a lost person step up and defend a believer because they say they wouldn't do that. Why? Because of this, this behavior that we see right here. That if they're going to speak evil against us as evildoers, that they are actually pushed to silence because nobody would believe them. If somebody comes up, you all have probably some, some kind of an idea or some, maybe some experience in this where somebody comes up and they say, do you hear about so-and-so? Do you hear what they did? And they tell you, and you say, I, I highly doubt it. I know, I know them. And you go to that person and say, hey, I heard that you did, that I, I've been hearing around town that this happened. They say, that's not actually what happened. And it bears out that if they're going to speak evil against me, 
Let it be because, like with Daniel, you remember when they went to find something against Daniel, they said, we're only going to find something against him as it relates to his God. Me meaning, we don't have any dirt on him, so we have to find something that we disagree with him about as it relates to his God. That's the, that's the thing he takes the most seriously. And that's exactly how we should be as believers. Many people will be offended by a believer who takes seriously the command to be like Christ. If you live a godly life in 2021, you will give offense to people. If you rub shoulders with people and you're living according to the dictates of God's word, they're going to consider you crazy. They're going to say, they're, they're a goody two-shoes or whatever the word is that they're using. They're, they're just, they're, they're fanatical. They're radical in their, in their obedience of God. And when faced with the choice to compromise or give a defense of the faith, I should stand up and be willing to speak truth. When given the choice between looking for a fight and avoiding one, I should try to avoid it. Live peaceably with all men. Meaning, there are some people, and, and I might be able to tell by the bumper sticker they have on their car, there are some people who I would disagree with, and they're they're, they're low-hanging fruit, to, just to be real honest with you. You know what I'm talking about? It would be easy to pick a fight, and you know you'd win. Don't go spoiling for a fight. Live a godly life. Because do you think that if I'm, being, if I'm walking with God, being led by the Spirit, that he can lead me to the fights that are worth having and help me to avoid the ones that will have no benefit to anyone? If I'm walking with God, you think he'd do that for me? Yeah. And those are the fights. Have you ever won a fight with somebody and you left? And you feel like, man, I, I won that fight. And I, I don't feel like I won anything. Some fights just aren't worth winning. And if I will live peaceably, as much as lieth within me, if I live peaceably with all men, and I let God lead me to the fights that I need to have, I say, look, I'm not disagreeing with you for, for, for personal reasons. This is what God says. They say, you're a bigot. Well, no. Let me show you what God says. I don't care what God says. Well, let me show you anyway what God says. I, I'm, I'm going to share what God says in this given situation. I'm not looking for a fight. It came to me. But I'm going to speak truth, and I'm going to let the, I'm going to let the fight be, well, that, that Ben Linville, all he ever does is he brings up the Bible. Okay, good place to stand. It's not, well, that, that Ben Lindell, he called me. Well, now we've entered a whole other realm. When I start calling names, when I descend to their level and I start repaying evil for evil, entered a whole other, a whole other world. So when you and I are treated poorly, rather than giving as good as we get, we should seek to follow the example of Christ and prepare to give a response that shows a heart of righteousness. It's going to take preparation because in the heat of the moment, what we are in the heat of the moment is either our natural fleshly instinct or it is a prepared spiritual response because I'm walking with the Lord so that when it happens, I say, Lord, I need you now <laughs> as, as I have the opportunity to respond in the flesh. It won't always be possible for me to avoid confrontation, but I shouldn't go looking for it. I don't remember who it was in, uh, in World War II. One of the generals said, only a fool goes more than 20 miles looking for a fight. Well, in, in the world in which we live, you don't have to go looking any amount of distance. You can find a fight on your phone. Real easy. I don't even have to get up to find a fight. Avoid fights if you, if you can. If people are going to take issue with you, make sure it's over a biblical reason. I should allow the Holy Spirit to guide me to the conflicts worth having. There are fights worth having. There are hills worth dying on. There are lines beyond which I won't cross. And they're all found right here. There are personal preferences that I'll sacrifice, but not biblically held convictions. Any other thoughts that you have? I have a funny story. Okay. I was working as a store planner in Troy, Missouri. And one of the, in that, that year, particularly, they hired these temporary companies to unload our containers. 
So I go to them at 8 o'clock at night. I said, I need this here, this here, this here, this here. Well, that particular night, they're going to reside all the coolers. And the company that was supposed to do it, to do it, was going to be there at 10 o'clock. And I promised them, I said, we're going to be out there. Don't worry about it. So I went out there at 9 o'clock. They hadn't done it. <laughs> so I says, hey, guys, uh, remember, I, I asked you to do this. And they said, oh, okay. It was 10 o'clock, the people were there, and we we're paying them to be there, and I says, the, the metal's going out there, and, and, uh, and I says, we need that in there right away. And he said, okay. 11.30, <laughs> okay. I said, gentlemen, I think I talked to you two more, about two times now, and I says, we need that stuff in there now, and it needs to be brought in immediately. Thank you. Don't walk away. Well, they come back to me two hours later and said, you cussed at us. We're turning you in. I said, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And he says, we're going to call corporate. I said, go ahead and call corporate. So one of their other jobs is they're supposed to take all the jewelry counters in that evening so they put jewelry counters together. They drop every jewelry counter, every jewelry counter for me was broke. Mm -hmm. So my boss comes in at 6 o'clock. He says, don't worry about it, Jim. You don't swear. Because <laughs> they said they cursed you. They, they, they told us you cursed them out. And he says, I know you. You work with it. How many? I said, you don't curse. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. It was like, what, what a blessing. Yeah, when, well, when a lost it's person. Quite an exciting evening. Yeah. yeah. When a lost person will stand up and say, look, I know so and so. They might not agree. They might would disagree with some of your positions. Yeah, but, you know. but they'll still stand yeah. up and say, look, I, I may not agree with him, and I don't go to church with him. But I know he didn't do what you're saying he did. That's, that's a, good, a good sign. Absolutely. 